It's my very great pleasure today to welcome Dr. Mark Rosenberg. And Mark is a neurology trainee in his final year at the Medical University of South Carolina. He studied human physiology at the University of Arizona and subsequently completed his medical degree at the University in Mexico. Mark is very active in research, particularly in understanding how the nervous system is affected in spaceflight. He has presented worldwide, including in England, France, and the UAE, and has been published in high impact medical journals, including JAMA. Mark is particularly fascinated by trying to identify the underlying pathophysiology of spaceflight associated neuroocular syndrome and how it may apply to terrestrial models. Outside of clinical aerospace, Mark is the vice lead for the Space Medicine and Life Sciences Project Group, a section of the Space Generation Advisory Council, and a Kármán program pioneer. We're not thinking about spaceflight. He loves weightlifting, running with his husky, and exploring historical sites with his wife. He loves sharing his passions for aerospace medicine and enjoys mentoring people considering a career in space medicine and neurology. So thank you again, Mark, very much indeed for coming along today and over to you. Thanks, Dr. Christensen. It didn't sound quite as over the top when I was writing it as it did when you were reading it. So, <laughs> but thank you. Um, so yeah, thank you for that uh, introduction. I love, um, aerospace medicine, and I especially love the human brain. And me being a hammer, I only see nails and those nails are neurons. And so for me, neurons are the most important thing. Um, and I pretty much think is the human body as a life support system for the brain. Um, and because of that, again, nothing's more important than that. And the reason why I really love kind of the junction between neurology and aerospace medicine is because it's really physiology on steroids you know the way that we kind of think about it in this community i'm sure dr chris has said is that you know kind of standard clinical medicine it's a um physiology um you know it's kind of the ill or sick physiology in a normal environment whereas aerospace medicine it's normal physiology and almost like a sick environment and that sick environment is really just not super compatible with life. And how does that ultimately translate to neurology? I got into this kind of as a, uh, you know, not sure way. I grew up just like a lot of us, I'm sure. We all loved science in some degree or another. We either grew up looking at the stars or we saw Jurassic Park or we saw other sci-fi movies and we're like, hey, this is super cool. Maybe you bought the Lego sets and you built a lot of planes where you were younger um, and, you saw the sci-fi movies and you saw the sci-fi shows and sure enough, I went to college and I went to medical school and I was like, okay, you know, the human body is what I really, really love. But then when it got to the point when I was early on in my residency, a lot of my friends, they knew what they wanted to do. They wanted to do epilepsy or they wanted to do neuroimmunology, like working with multiple sclerosis. And I loved taking care of patients, but it still wasn't really quite scratching that itch. And it wasn't until um, my wife had actually purchased the Saturn V rocket, the Lego set for me, that I was like, oh, wait, now I remember. And it was like that scene, and it's not just because I'm nostalgic in, in, in uh, Paris, but it was like that scene from Ratatouille where the, the critic eats the tomato and then like all the memories kind of come rushing back to him. And I was like, oh, wait is this a thing? I don't know. And I know Dr. Christensen, has, she's been an incredible spokeswoman about just how, how marvelous space medicine is. Um, but sure enough, it is. Um, and it's not only that, it's kind of entering its uh, renaissance right now. Everybody's wanting to get more people involved. And once I kind of start dipping my toes into it, there were these titans in the industry, like Dr. Christensen, that they were like, no, you can't just dip your toes in, you got to jump in. They kind of pulled me in. And since then, I've kind of been the same way. Um, it's very collaborative. It's um, very encouraging um, because this is going to affect all of us and it's going to affect our kids and our grandkids and kind of the future of humanity. So not only are we working with people who could have um, you know, clinical conditions, but it's also the normal people. And we're trying to see what's happening when humanity reaches further into the cosmos. And me again, being with neurology, I wanted to see, okay, what's going on? 
Sure enough, there are particular conditions that we have seen um, in people that have done more so long duration spaceflight. We have seen um, neuroocular changes, so progressive vision loss. How it happens is not super, super well understood. We think that there might be some kind of component of um, the blood that pulls in your legs, it kind of shifts to your head. And because your body can't really deal with that kind of pressure, it might cause uh, deformation of the eyes. Still trying to work at that out. We're also seeing space motion sickness. That's something that's been seen, seen pretty much since outside of the Gemini. Um, Apollo, they got it a little bit. And the more space we've had in the capsules, it's become more of a problem, um, particularly with, uh, with Mir and, uh, and uh, kind of in, in some of the ISS. And the other thing that we've seen more recently is actual changes with the pathways in the brain associated with cognition and with proprioception. Um, so one of the kind of brilliant studies that was done maybe three or four months ago is they utilize tractography, which is a fairly new imaging modality. And they're able to look at the certain white matter tracks in the brain. And they saw that the density of certain white matter tracks, particularly the ones that are well known to be associated with cognition and proprioception actually got a lot, they shrink. So they got a lot more thin um, in space flight. It kind of makes intuitive sense, right? You know, proprioception, it's all kind of screwed up being without gravity feedback. Um, the cognitive one is also a little bit more concerning as well, uh, as you obviously can kind of assume the longer we're in space, is there a plateauing effect? Is it continue? And if it does continue, could these cognitive concerns get to the point where there is a mission critical aspect? The thing for me is being a specialist does afford a little bit of a different kind of perspective um, you know, Dr. Dr. Uh, Christensen, she is very much so an emergency physician. She responds to, you know, people having accidents on ski lifts or, you know, it's very rapid. Um, and me being where I am in, in South Carolina, yeah, of course, we take care of people when they've had the strokes, but a big part of us too is, is prevention. And Dr. Christensen could definitely attest to how preventative this is. That's why we do the analogs. That's why we do the runs and the scenarios. And one of the things we try and do within neurology is we try and take analog conditions that might overlap into it. And so oftentimes us being specialists, we just have a little bit more just in-depth knowledge uh, because even for someone that dedicates their lives to the nervous system, there's still way too much to know. Um, and then you take it, you add this extra layer of complexity and you throw that into space. Um, and so that's what we've kind of done in Charleston. We've taken a bunch of um, neuro specialists from neuro ophthalmologists to neuro vestibular specialists to surgeons um, and kind of just thrown us all in a room together because I'm not gonna know about how blood flow is compared to a neurovascular specialist. And I'm not gonna know how the spine acts in space compared to a neurosurgeon. And I'm not gonna know uh, how as much of the neurovestibular system is as you know, a vestibular specialist. And so we put us all together because we're having that conversation, which I think is the first part of preventative medicine is you have to actually start talking about those problems. And one of the reasons why I think people like you, students, are so great is because you bring fresh ideas and you're always, I think, really creativity outside the box. And man, med students, they know more about the nitty gritty because you have to more than practicing clinicians. And if there's something that doesn't make sense to it, bring it up because there might be a research opportunity there, or there might be something that's going to be fleshed out that when you take the human body and you stress it to the max, like in the way of space flight, it might be a breaking point. And that's just something that we might not necessarily see, especially you have the gray beard physicians that have been practicing for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. They're not going to remember, you know, the CYP 450 and how that kind of stuff is, you know, you just forget about those things. Um, but we're starting to see that it's actually starting to rear its head. You know, for example, going back to the neuro, the, the neuroocular syndrome, like I was telling you about, we're actually seeing that there might be a problem with the carbon one uh, metabolism, which is uh, something associated with folate. Now, when that research came out, I definitely had to go back to my um, 
step one for the first aid or first aid for the step one book. And I had to read through that. So it's definitely something that I had to familiarize myself a little bit more. Um, but it's, it's, it's great that we can collaborate the way that we do. And it's even better that everybody has something to offer, which is another reason why I felt so welcomed and so at home within space medicine, because I didn't see some of the obstacles that I noticed more in academic medicine. And I realized that even me being, you know, a second year resident, my ideas and my thoughts were deeply considered and were actually carried forward. And that's continued to this day. And that's a huge reason why I'm a big advocate for space medicine, because I want to afford and I want to offer that was given to me. Um, and that's why I always try and speak as much as I can, even if I'm 20 minutes late, sorry about that, but I always try and, um, you know, speak as much as I can to impassion more people about it. If I can bring you more to neurology, that's, that's great. We always need more people. Um, and of course, if I can get people that can help me out, that's even better because, you know, that's also fantastic. Um, but, uh, you know, that's why I, I choose to do what I do. And, and more importantly, because of what space medicine has given to me, I always want to kind of carry it in return. And this isn't just me, this is everybody. And this is why, you know, I'm running a few minutes late from IAC because we basically, it's the Olympics for, for us space nerds. You kind of come together and you talk about every um, communication relays to physiology, to pharmaceutic, pharmaceuticals. And you're, you're getting to talk with people from all up and down um, the uh, kind of the business hierarchy and every single person is warm and receptive. Um, and I just didn't see that anywhere else. And so that's a huge reason why I'm optimistic about space medicine. It's a huge reason why I think, you know, considering maybe some kind of career in it might not be a bad idea um, because you won't ever feel like you made the wrong decision. You won't ever feel like, hey, maybe I uh, might have had FOMO for something else because every day you're going to be reminded that, you're with the right kind of forward thinking people and you're with the people that will want to push your career forward just as much as you want to push other people forward. So, yeah, thanks. Oh, thank you very much. That, that was, um, I think, gave, gave uh, everyone here today a lot of insight as to, to why you got interested in it and also why people like you and me find find the, uh, yeah. the field so, so appealing and so interesting. Um, so what, what we might do, if you're okay with it, is just see if there are any questions that people would, would like to ask. Uh, and we've still got quite a bit of time left. So I think anything that you would like to, uh, to ask, please go ahead, Marta. I was wondering what research are you currently working on? Yeah, um, thanks for that, that's a great question. So there's a couple of things uh, here in IAC in particular. Um, there's two presentations that I'm doing. Um, one was, well, three, but, um, you know, two of them were working with Space Generation Advisory Council. Um, the other one is research that I'm doing at my institution. But the, the main thing that we're looking at right, right now, especially in Charleston, is something called um, SANS, or Space Flight Associated Neuroocular Syndrome. And if you all have seen the show Away with Hilary Swank, it was on Netflix for, unfortunately, just one season. Um, in that show, there's a Russian cosmonaut that he progressively loses his vision. It's actually like a major plot point. It's something that we've seen in 60 to 70% of all NASA astronauts, particularly after two weeks, and it is a progressive vision loss. Um, they, for that reason, get sent up with a couple of pairs of glasses called space anticipation glasses. It's that well known and that expected that it's just part of what they go through. And the question is why it's happening. We don't fully know yet. We think it might be related to pressure. We think it might be associated with, like I said, metabolism. It could be dietary. It could be exercise driven. Um, and it could be something else that we don't know. Um, epigenetics is something that's being investigated as well. So that's what we do in Charleston. Me in particular, though, what I look at is actual cerebrovascular changes. So how blood flow is affected. Um, arterial side is hard, but the venous side in particular is something that we look at pretty often. Um, there's a condition that's oftentimes considered, it's not identical, but it's the best that we've got. Um, there's a condition called idiopathic intracranial hypertension, pseudotumor cerebri. It is a condition that is thought to be increased pressure in you know, a quarter of the patients is because they might have uh, stenoses of the dural veins, which causes increased pressure. 
Um, and, you know, they get a lot of the ocular findings. It's really similar to that. It's not identical again, but it's really similar to the ocular findings we get in NIH. So we look at those patients. So um, the PI on several studies in patients with IAH, we're doing pressure like inter, inter jugular catheterization and doing pressure monitoring at different um, positions. Um, but we also more so do a lot of venogram studies. So we have access to um, uh, kind of the astronaut health. It's called um, uh, the Lifetime Surveillance and Astronaut Health Program offered through NASA. We get venogram data. We're assessing that. That was what my JAM article was last year. We're actually updating it with even more people. We're trying to make it transnational as well with the collaboration. Um, but uh, you know, the thought is, especially looking at what uh, Serena and Chancellor found with this jugular venous stuff, that there might be some something more of a of a cerebrovascular component to things. That sounds really interesting. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, of course. Um, I know with a lot of research in terms of with the astronauts and whatnot, it's quite difficult to get actual access to, you know, the astronauts and to space. Like, what has your experience been with trying to get that actual data when there's such a small pool of astronauts and so many people want to do experiments on them? Gosh, yeah, that is like the million dollar question that, I get asked all the time. And actually I was talking with um, a very, very, very prominent ENT surgeon from South Africa that has that exact same problem. I do, I do come from a point of privilege just purely based off the fact that I'm a US citizen and we do have that. Um, that being said, ESA and Roscosmos, you know, the connections are available. Um, I'm not sure how easy they are but oftentimes what I, what I really recommend, and one of the reasons why um, SJC and SMLS in particular, why we encourage research is because there's so much we don't know that even theorizing in the form of a lit review is enough to kind of scratch that itch. Of course, you can always do more, um, but it can at least allow for you to, to um start to step into the world of research while at the same time allowing you to kind of look at from a different way questions that might not have been asked previously. So there is there is that and that's why I'm a huge uh, champion for SMLS in particular is that it gives people the opportunity to do some research while you know while things kind of work their work their way because it is it is a little bit tough. It is. Hi, um, I had a question about, I'm sorry, it sounds like you're doing, your main focus right now is research, and I was wondering if um, you're, you're still working in the clinical environment, and if so, how has the, how has your research informed um, your clinical practice? Yeah, so another fantastic question. Um, in, and I can really only fully speak of in the United States, but in the U.S., there is a, a, a really hard delineation between clinical aerospace medicine and research. Um, you know, right now, I'm in my last year of, of, of residency, I'll be applying to be a flight surgeon next year. Um, but most of the people that are, well, that's not true. I think most of the people that are active in research are actually not flight surgeons. You have a lot of flight surgeons that are that are doing the clinical side of things, but you don't need to go to UT Medical Branch or King's College of London or the University of Oswego. You don't need to do those to become a very prominent researcher. Um, you know, Dr. Christensen, she's known as being one of the like the emergency med, you know, space medicine people. But I don't. Did you ever do like an actual like you're not board certified in, in uh, like flight medicine? Are you, Dr. Christensen? No, the, uh, the system yeah. here is quite different to, to the United States. So we don't have the same opportunity, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. And, but, the, but the thing is, is that even like, you know, the, the, what I would say is some of the experts in the United States on, on different subjects, they're not flight surgeons. They're their own people and they just carved out a name for themselves because again, they were asking the right questions and they were taking it upon themselves to do more of that research. Um, and they are, I mean, they're, they're I mean, they're very happy with what they do and they're the kind of, they're the go-to people 
for that. As far as clinical um, aerospace medicine, that is a little bit different. So clinical aerospace medicine is kind of divided into two big realms or three big realms, um, space, aviation, and then dive medicine, or, you know, kind of more extreme environments like mountaineering. Um, space medicine is more limited. Uh, in the United States, there is, of course, more of the commercial options, so that is opening up, but it's still not super, super robust. The other part of it is the actual flight clinic at NASA, um, and that's run, you know, nine to five most days of the year. Um, and you do get astronauts with, with pretty high regularity. With the dive medicine, um, that is broken a down a little bit more. So you have, of course, a neutral, the neutral buoyancy lab. And so the ones that are help cater into all their needs, but also, you know, the aquanauts that do a lot of um, analog research so that also kind of falls under the warehouse. And then, of course, the other thing is um, the aviation. So not only working with pilots directly, but also the FAA um, and doing a lot of like uh, disaster evaluation. So if a plane were to crash, you know, their job is as forensic aerospace people to show up, try and figure out why the accident happened, figure out what they could do or what, could, what kind of protocols they could come up with to prevent it from happening. Um, so it depends, you know, right now, if you're going to be 100% clinical space medicine, that's just not feasible at the moment. Um, that's And I think that's part of the reason why people are so involved with research, because they're super, super passionate and they have to outlet that energy in some way or another. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, so you've uh, mentioned that, you know, not a lot of people, that you can't be purely clinical quite yet. And there's a lot of flight Correct. surgeons on the ground. Um, mm -hmm. So in like sort of like the next, you know, decade or two, when we're starting to move towards like longer term moon missions and maybe Mars missions, um, do you see sort of having a medical doctor or a flight surgeon going on those missions as a priority? Or do you think for a long time having, you know, relaying back to earth for a lot of medical advice is going to be the main means of that? Yeah, fa fan, that's a fantastic question. Um, so there's two, two, two big camps right now, uh, maybe kind of three, maybe like two and a half camps right now. So there's one, yes, a hundred percent. We need a physician there just in case, whatever, you know, you have to have someone there. The other one is, is okay, but what if, you know, what if we were able to um, automate certain processes, for example, um, exploration medical capabilities at NASA, their job is to kind of strategize, anticipate, and hopefully, you know, reduce the risk of complications. And one of those things is, you know, if something happens and the physician is the person that's sick or whatever, you know, so EXMC, what they do is, is kind of that. And they developed, you know, for example, something called AMOS, which is basically a, it's almost like a paint by numbers of ultrasounds. Um, that common, just, uh, you know, a non-physician astronaut could use. And they're trying to implement these fail-safes in case something were to happen. Um, I think even the, you know, physicians, they're, they certainly aren't um, immune to getting sick. And so I, you know, of course, at least until something is more protocolized, I would err on the side of caution and say that a physician is important. And I think, especially if we're looking at a colony, I think there's just going to be some things that the system can't predict. And you just have to lean on the heuristic sense that's developed from seeing thousands of patients that a physician offers that would be quite critical. Um, if it gets to the point where technology can substitute that, then, then that's awesome. And there are people that are very active in trying to figure out how can they best integrate artificial intelligence with virtual reality, with extended reality, with telemetric services, blah, 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 trying to kind of bring the medicine to a more accessible degree. But like you said, you know, the further we go out, the more lag there's going to be. And so they're also trying to look at how to automate the process as well so that you're not relying on telemetric services as much. I think when it comes to low Earth orbit and the moon, you with low Earth orbit, yeah, the moon, you might be able to get by with, you know, someone doing extended reality and offering telemetric services. But with Mars, you're going to need to have, you're going to need to have something that is entirely self-sufficient. Let that be, you know, artificial intelligence, but that's really, really challenging. That's a hot word that kind of gets, that's a buzzword that gets thrown around, thrown around a lot. Or do we send a physician? I think more realistically, we're going to get to the point where we need to have a physician there for at least a, a while um, before we might be able to consider them not going. 
Also, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I might just quickly ask, one of the sort of issues with research in general is um, the adherence or compliance to sort of the research goals by like the people that you're actually investigating on and they might not be sort of perfect. How do you find that with like astronauts? Obviously, like they're very busy people and are doing a lot of things up in space or back down on Earth, but also they are quite professional. So like how, how have you found it in your experience actually dealing with those people and getting information out of those people? It's, it's interesting, right? Because there's very few jobs where involvement in research won't potentially threaten your job. Um, for example, let's say I'm doing genetic research and I'm looking for certain key biomarkers that might result in, I don't know, kidney disease or something. Um, and I'm looking at astronauts and one of the astronauts biomarkers pops up as like super, super, super likely to develop some kind of kidney disease. Is that going to potentially screen them out or not? Um, you know, there is that kind of ethical dilemma, but surprisingly enough, the astronauts have been very generous with their time and with their, um, with their information. And it's actually part of, it's kind of protocolized into just the standard practice of, of training as well as pre-flight, in, in-flight and post-flight. And we're talking about post-flight, like I said before, it's the lifetime surveillance health program, like it continues until the end of time. And the people at, at NASA in the flight lab, they'll have astronauts, you know, the, you know um, like Buzz Aldrin, from what I was told, still pops by for, his annual test. Um, and so these people are super, yeah, I mean, they believe in, they believe in the future of humanity and exploration. If, and if they can provide as much information as possible, they will. So they're super busy, but astronauts can also tell you that busy is kind of what they do. Um, you know, you've heard the term chasing the red line. These guys, they live on increments of five minutes when they're in space. And so they can, if especially if they need to, they can carve out the time to uh, to humor somebody getting you know sticking them with a with a needle. So, thank you. <laughs> those have all been really great questions, and thank you very much, yeah. Mark, for those those very insightful answers. Any any other questions anybody would like to ask? So, um, Mike, I was, was thinking uh, you're a member of the Space Generation Advisory Council Space Medicine and Life Sciences Project, and I was wondering if you might like to, to tell the students a little bit more about that initiative and what's involved in that and how they might potentially be able to get involved. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. So, so SJC in, in particular, the SMLS is something that I'm, I'm very fond of. Um, so SJC, Space Generation Advisory Council, has been for, I've been around for 20 plus years. And it is an organization that is under the United Nations Office of Space Affairs. Um, it was designed as a mission directorate for the purpose of trying to increase interest um, efficacy and kind of activity in young people worldwide um, in the pursuit of spaceflight. Um, and SJC in particular, one of the main things that they really are passionate about is trying to share kind of the opportunities for people to get excited. Because again, you know, speaking from a point of privilege in the United States, I do have the opportunities even if it is still challenging, I do have more of an opportunity to do research or um, clinical practice in something like this, whereas other people won't, you know, in Australia, New Zealand, or even, you know, even more challenging in Southeast Asia or in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and one of the things that I really like about SJC is, one, it's free, so there's no barrier from that standpoint, uh, but two, it's meant to kind of bridge the gap and it's assumed that when you get into it, you're you're hopefully trying to bring as much as you can so that if there's someone that needs to take a little bit so that the future they can kind of carry it forward and give more, then that's what you do. And that's why, um, like I was saying, uh, two of the presentations that were given yesterday, yesterday I did one and somebody else gave another, they were actually um, abstracts and papers that were developed by just a ragtag group of people that were interested in a particular topic, all within the auspices of 
the space medicine and life sciences project group within SGAC. And the thing that brought us together was, you know, I, myself and some of the other leads in our group, we said, hey, why don't we do something that allows for someone, you know, somebody that's in high school, or I guess just finishing high school, all the way up to being a professional, they can kind of collaborate with each other so that the people that are the professionals that have more time and experience with research can kind of share their knowledge and more so share some real world opportunities with the, the student. Um, plus, if they can both get their names on a publication, especially a publication that previously hadn't really been done and more so kind of push, push further that conversation, then that's really what it's all about. Um, and so that's why I really, really like SMLS because it just gives people the opportunity to have a, a, a shared space to talk about your interests with space medicine or life sciences if you're more the, you know, the biologic sciences kind of person. Um, it gives them a shared space to kind of have that conversation and learn how different people ha have different approaches or thoughts on certain topics that might be relevant to, to space medicine today. Great, thank you very much for that. And I think that there's there's a web page for the, the SGAC SML. There is. Yeah, there is. We are we are updating it right now uh, after a long, long delay. So bear with that. That being said, um, Dr. Christensen, you can send my email out after this if anybody has any questions. And I'm always always happy to talk about, particularly with neurology stuff, because that's just what I feel the most comfortable with. But kind of any questions that any of y'all might have from career stuff to more so the actual content as well within space mess i'm obviously more than happy and if i don't know then that's great because that means it's something i can always learn more which there's a lot that i don't know uh, which is always great and especially with med students like i said you guys you guys forget a lot more than i'll ever learn so um yeah please 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 don't let this be the end of the conversation because there's always some way that i can get more people involved <laughs> Well, thank you. That's that's really generous of you, and um, I'll, I'll definitely do that. Now, the last thing that, that I'd just like to ask you to talk a little bit about is I know you've also been involved with AMSRO, with the Aerospace Medical mm -hmm. Association, and maybe if, um, even though we're international, obviously, um, just maybe a little bit about that and how it's still worthwhile for for people like our wonderful students to to be involved even though we're we're far away thank you yeah so AMSRO is another absolutely critical opportunity and resource but most importantly the networking tool that AMSRO provides is very 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 um, important when it comes to how you want to be involved with the conversations um, like I mentioned before the people in this world are extremely generous and they're also extremely passionate uh, maybe borderline scary passionate uh but you know i i fall in that camp so i'm okay with that i can say that um and amsro is just another opportunity to meet those people and to have those conversations because there might be something that you're super passionate about or super interested that you're reading this article and something kind of popped up you're like oh that doesn't quite make sense but you can't get that answer because that has never been written about so you ask the person who wrote the paper and AMSRO is one of those, is one of those kind of lubricants when it comes to facilitating that, facilitating that kind of conversation because it is a small world. It's a really, really small world. So even if you don't have the opportunity of speaking with that person directly, you'll speak with somebody who knows that person really well. And, uh, and you know, Dr. Chris said she's an incredible resource. She knows a lot of people in this, but in case you can't or in case you don't know, then AMSRO is really the next next best step um, because they do that. Furthermore, you know, it is it is tough because y'all are on the other side of the world. Um, but AMSRO is also another uh, kind of key player when it comes to the um, Aerospace Medicine Association, um, ASMA. AMSRO is kind of like the extension for the medical students and residents. And so they do try and encourage more of a collaborative mentoring opportunity or chance as well. Um, and so that's why it is important to be a member of AMSRO because you're more, you have your more kind of ear to the grindstone, you're more involved with the conversations at an earlier level. Um, so that way you're not thinking, you know, a year or two later, you're like, oh man, I wonder what happened with that idea that I really want to talk about. No, you just, you just do it. And the easier or the less obstacles there are to, to get that conversation started, 
you know, the sooner you might find that satisfaction or that gratification. It is also tough in space medicine. You know, it's not as hands-on, it's not as active as other aspects of medicine. So without kind of a weekly reminder of what you, why you're doing what you're doing, um, it might get a little bit hard to kind of keep your eyes on the prize. And AMSO is constantly doing speakers, constantly giving you information from people that kind of can excite you. Um, and that's why I think it's also great to have AMSO because you're gonna hear from a whole variety of speakers from pharmacists to researchers, to physician astronauts, to you know clinician researchers, all, everybody kind of across the board. Um, so yeah. Thank you very much. And um, it's it's been wonderful to have this lovely relaxed conversation with you today. And on behalf of all of us, I would like to say um, a very, very huge thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming along, especially because I know it's so late in Paris and it's been a wonderful way to round off the year. So I'd like to wish you the very best for the remainder of your, your time in Paris. And if we can all just say thank you very much to Mark for coming along today. Uh, and I will definitely share your email with the students. Thank you very much for that and look forward to keeping in touch. So thank you once again. It's been really lovely to see you. Yeah, of course. Again, I just want to, you know, just emphasize don't hesitate to reach out. I'll try and if I can answer the question, I'll try and find you the person that can. And if you want to collaborate with research, um, you know, even though IAC is happening now. We have a hope that would give us just a whole year to kind of come up with ideas and prepare for for next year which baku is a lot closer to australia so maybe there's something there fantastic well thank you thank you very much once yeah. again and i'll let you go and get some well-deserved sleep <laughs> thank you thank you so much thank you. thank you of course thank all right you. bye bye